And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and -and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm Ray Shasho. Welcome to the show where we interview legendary and up-and-coming music artists and authors. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Jock Bartley is known for his melodic, tasteful, and fiery lead guitar style, influencing many rock and country rock guitarists. Leaving college to pursue music, he joined the Boulder Bass Band Zephyr, replacing Tommy Boland as lead guitarist. Uh, Tommy, of course, joined the James Gang after that, later Deep Purple, uh, before his untimely death in 1977. Months after the Sunset Ride album came out, Zephyr broke up. 1972, Jock was asked to join the touring band of the legendary Graham Parsons and the Fallen Angels, uh, featuring Emmy Lou Harris. Graham had joined the Birds on the groundbreaking Sweetheart of the Radio album, formed the Flying Burrito Brothers uh, with Chris Holman, and was a pioneer of the new musical genre, country rock. The Fallen Angels... Uh, tour made many memorable stops from Texas to Boston, including the show in Houston where Neil Young and Linda Ronstadt sat in on stage. Emmy Lou and Linda met that night and sang together for the first time. At Max's Kansas City in New York City, Jock met Boulder resident Rick Roberts, who we had on the show, who'd replaced Graham and the Burrito Brothers and had two solo albums out. In 74... Rick and Jock began jamming in Boulder with Mark Andes, who we just talked with. Uh, Mark, bassist from the progressive L.A. band Spirit and JoJo Gunn. When Larry Burnett arrived from D.C., Fire Up Fall was formed. A few months in, drummer Michael Clark, formerly of the Birds and Flying Burrito Brothers, joined the band. Rick, Mark, and Jock were on tour with Chris Hillman on the East Coast when Chris became ill. Larry and Michael were flown in, and Firefall finished the engagement at the Bitter End in New York City, where Atlantic Records came to hear, soon signing them to a long-term contract. David Muse joined the band in rehearsals with producer Jim Mason. Firefall recorded their first album at Criteria Studios in the winter of 1975, during which his guitar hero Eric Clapton was in the control room while Jock played the one-take lead guitar track on Mexico. It was a good thing I didn't know he was watching. I wouldn't have been able to hold my pick or play one note, says Jock. Jock has played on stage with artists, including Stephen Stills, Neil Young, the Doobie Brothers, Dan Fogelberg, Journey, Hart, Poco, John Mayo, and many, many others. He's a spokesman for suicide prevention, having worked with the American Association of Suicidology and the Christian Books Hope Center to uh, put on benefit concerts to raise awareness, help fund the first national crisis line, 800-SUICIDE, and save lives. He's also involved with causes including child abuse, domestic violence, burn victims, camps, environmental issues, and others. Jock is a record producer, travels frequently to Nashville to write songs, and gives seminars on creativity and songwriting for the Nashville Songwriters Association and the Songwriters Guild. He endorses Paul Reed Smith guitars and Takamine guitars. He has produced an acclaimed instructional songwriting video called The Complete Guide to Songwriting, How to Write a Song. Jock has also been a painter and fine artist since childhood, but only since 2001 has he gotten serious about his new art career. His colorful paintings and pastels in a wide variety of subjects have begun receiving wide critical and public acclaim. His work has been exhibited in art galleries in Denver and Vail, Colorado, and Reno, Nevada, with more to come. Perching a few shows featuring rock and roll artists, 
His paintings have hung next to John Lennon Lithos and paintings by Ronnie Wood of the Stones, Grace Slick, and others. In 2006, for the Beatles, paintings appeared in a nationally released coffee table book, Beatles Art, Fantastic New Artwork of the Fab Four. Jock's paintings and prints were included in the, in the uh, Denver Children's Hospital Benefit, Rockers for Kids, featuring art by Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, John Mellencamp, Jerry Garcia, David Bowie, Ron Wood, Grace Lake, Janis Joplin, and R. Crom and other artists. Jock Bartley and Firefall will be on the road again beginning June 9th in Norfolk, Virginia at Harbor Fest. <clears throat> Please welcome Jock Bartley, legendary guitarist, singer, and songwriter, to the Ray Shasho Show. Hello, Jock. How's it going, Ray? That was a long piece of that you just read. Well, you've had a long career. <laughs> I guess so. I feel old. <laughs> no, you guys are in great shape. I'm so ha- happy with the uh, <clears throat> excuse me current Firefall lineup. Me I'm, too. You know, I'm happy that David's there. Uh, you, Mark. We just talked to Mark recently. Uh, it's awesome. It's 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 one of my favorite bands of all time. You guys um, deserve superstardom, and uh, I, you know I guess you had a couple of uh, obstacles in your way along the way, but you know I just, just a fantastic <laughs> yeah, we had a couple band. Couple obstacles that didn't <laughs> didn't quite make it, but you know what the, uh, the the great thing about Firefall, and you know my hats off to the original singer songwriters Rick Roberts and Larry Burnett in the band. Yeah, uh, from our first day of rehearsal in Boulder, Colorado, back in about '74, we had 25 or 30 original songs by Rick and Larry to work out. So, Mark wow. and I were in, you know, in just heaven, going, "Okay, how, hey, you got anything else?" And they say, "Sure." You know, we had so many good songs, and I think that's the reason that uh, Firefall has, you know, continued um, uh, for so many decades, and also pretty much thrived in the in- industry and are still a good ticket seller because of how great those songs were and the magical performances that we made during the studio. Well, you know, you guys are just great musicians. That's, you know, that's that's something that kind of lacks today, you know, on uh, mainstream radio. You guys are just great yeah. musicians, you know? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, yeah, when you had, when Firefall had two very prolific, singer-songwriters in the band, and then you had Mark Andes, one of the best bass players on the planet, yeah. you know, so tasty and so solid. I mean, Mark is unbelievable. Uh, myself, who's trained and, you know, a, a rocker from way back when, David Muse, the multi-instrumentalist from uh, Clearwater, Florida, who plays damn near every instrument known to man, and then the legendary Michael Clark on drums, the king of 4-4, four, four, you know, uh, we had some really great musicians in the band, and we had two great singer-songwriters in the band, and, you know, and uh, it, I think it was destined to be. Plus, we have a mutual friend, our buddy uh, Joe Lala, who was also part part of the band. Uh, yep. And played on a, a few albums. You know, Joe, you know, when I talked to Joe, he was always wanting to be an official member of Firefall. <laughs> he always told me that. Really? Yes. I, you know, I, I I didn't know that, although whenever we played in Florida and uh, out on the road, sometimes when the band could afford it, we would definitely bring him out. He played, Joe Lala played such an amazing role on all of our albums, um, at least the first four, you know, the first four years or something. Joe's all over that and was just the best percussionist in rock and roll for 15, 20 years and so, so saddening and and sorrowful when he uh, when he passed a couple of years ago, but man, he was amazing. And you know, the sidelight that not too many people is um, Firefall's song "It Doesn't Matter," which was written by Chris Hillman and Rick Roberts when they were in the Flying Breeder Brothers together, although it never was recorded. Um, the Firefall version, which came out on our first album in 1976, uh, when Chris left the Breeder Brothers and joined into Stephen Stills and Manassas. That was one of the songs he took. Stephen really liked the song, although he changed a lot, most of the lyrics. And uh, 
and uh, the, 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 that would be the second version of It Doesn't Matter. Joe Lala played on both versions of It Doesn't Matter, and it's just so cool to, to hear that and to hear a great song like that, and we miss Joe, for sure. Yeah, he was a great guy. You know, he, he was 100% Sicilian, but to me, he acted more Cuban than anything else because of his association with Ybor City. And, and my mom, my mom was Cuban, so I really, you know, he was like part of the family for me. <laughs> oh yeah, I, you know, for, cool for the first, for the first four or five years that I knew Joe back in the seventies and early eighties, I thought he was Cuban. And then when I heard that he wasn't, I went, "Oh my gosh!" Really? He played. He the best feel, and you can listen to any of those players, also, the big hits or even the album cuts, and all over it, and just added such a sound to. Uh, you know, to a rock solid with Michael Clark and Mark Andy. Yeah, he was so happy with that reunion show. Uh, I think it was in 2008 at the Boulder yep. Theater. He was so happy. He said he had such a wonderful time at that. That was that was really great. And you know, after a while, I just figured, you know, we have to do this reunion show. You know, whether Rick Roberts was in condition to. Of course, we've had some music um, problems and voice problems and stuff, and you know it was just so fulfilling to have everybody come into Boulder and play a gig. And Rick was in the uh, was in the audience, and we, you know talked about him and talked him with, you know, every chance we could get. And you know, because without Rick Roberts. There would have been this airfall, and, and you know, Rick was such an amazing songwriter. When he had those two um, A&M uh, solo albums out, and he and I started working, we were initially thinking that I would just be a guitar player on his next solo record, but as soon as Mark Andes got in the fold, it was like, oops, I think we're bad. And that's when Rick said, hey, I know a guy in D.C. who has some great songs, and he and I sound great singing together. We should get him out here. And suddenly Larry Burnett was a Colorado resident, too, and, you know, the rest is kind of history. I'm originally from D.C., and uh, he actually became a disc jockey, um, I think WCXR radio. He, he was on the air in D.C. after Firefall. Right. Yeah. For a number of years. And then also, because Larry has, has such a resonant, great voice, he did. Uh, he made a living doing uh, voiceover jobs for radio and other things, you know, and stuff. Uh, so yeah, Larry's voice and Rick's voice together would just, I mean, that's when I listen to the Firefall records that we made back in the 70s, you know, their vocal blend was just incredibly, you know, moving and just, you know, it was really great together. And their songs, went the gamut from, you know, Larry's hard rock songs to his lighter songs. And Larry kind of was a darker personality than Rick, Rick Roberts was. And Ricky's um, harder rock songs and then his ballads, when you put all of them together, suddenly you had this wide range of songs that Michael and Mark and David and I were just so happy to, to lend our hand to also. And we had a synergy making records that... Very few bands ever have, and we never had to try to sound like us. When we'd work right. out a song, it would sound like Firefall, and I think a lot of that was due to Michael Clark's drumming and Mark Andes' bass playing and my guitar playing and David's flute and sax work. You know, uh, you know I've, I've been blessed in my musical career and my life, and it's amazing, you know, 40-plus years later to still be doing it. Well, you guys had three gold albums, two platinum albums, 11 hit singles, including You Are the Woman and Just Remember I Love You, which was a Billboard number one. Uh, the single You Are the Woman has been played on commercial radio over 7 million times. And yep. you, guys, you guys were inducted into the Colorado Music Hall of Fame in 2015, so congratulations for that. Well, thank you very much. That induction class was amazing. It was the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Poco that had uh, 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 Richie Fury and Timothy B. Schmidt back in the band for that one night, yep. and uh, a tribute to Stephen Stills in Manassas. 
and Firefall. Yep. It was like, boy, what what a class to be inducted with. Well, you belong there. You guys are awesome. You still are awesome. Well, thank you. You know, yeah. I, 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 I was fortunate to, to see you guys play twice, and I saw Mark play with Spirit a while ago. But I remember uh, seeing you guys in Hollywood, Florida, backing up Hart. You, you, you were on yeah. the floor with Hart. Yeah. You guys were incredible. Uh, you know, my favorite. Well, thanks. Hit. You know, and like I say, you know, it was. It, it, was, it sure was great, and um, it was interesting, though, because after You Are the Woman was such a big hit in 1976, our record label, Atlantic, basically really wanted to have like five or eight You Are the Woman per record, and they wanted this to be that light, poppy, you know, soft rock band, but we were a harder rocking unit, you know, that had two or three or four really nice ballads per record. So it was always interesting. We always wanted them to put out some of the harder material and the more rock right. and stuff, but they kept putting, you know, and they, hey, there's nothing wrong with just remember I love you and you are the woman is great and, you know, that's the reason those songs are really pretty much the reason we still work a lot, you know, right. here in 2018. But, you know, we're a rocking band, and when people who are only familiar with our albums come out and see it, you know, they're kind of surprised that we rock so, so much and that Mark and I dig in and jam, and it's it's just so much fun to still be doing this. Uh, your album, is it Elan? Is that how you pronounce that? Um, it's called Elan. Elan, ah. okay. Elan, which the word means verve or going or excitement or something. And, uh, right. And that's just what we picked for the, the third album. That that was, I think, your best album, right? Uh, as far as commercial wise, um, probably, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Between our third and our first album, um, you know, definitely our a long album, our third album, was the quickest one to go platinum, and that was right when we were on the road with Fleetwood Mac during the Rumors right. tour, and you know, and playing with Leonard Skinner and the Doobie Brothers and the band and all these people that it was just like, well, the band was a little bit earlier. But um, we were just so fortunate in our timing, you know, that uh, we then got to become players on the road with all the best bands that You guys were riding on such a high, and then uh, a little turmoil during that album. I think Tom Boyd, uh, Tom Dowd was brought in to produce it. Uh, then they brought in, you guys brought in Ron and Howard Albert uh, to finish the record. Um, and then th there's an issue with your management, right? Where but wasn't Mick Fleetwood <laughs> think, thinking about taking over or something like that? Well, that, that brings up three or four different issues, but um, <laughs> basically... The Tom Dowd album we made, when Rick and Larry presented the songs that we were going to work out, and we took those songs and recorded them, Tom Dowd, who is is and was one of the most amazing producers right. in the music business ever, his vision of our third record was kind of kind of like a Crosby, Stills and Nash thinner mm -hmm. record with without a lot of doubled guitars or doubled voices. and We don't need drums on every track, and it was just kind of, you know, his vision of the band ended up being, you know, somewhat different than what we thought. And um, at that critical moment when we finished the album and Tom mixed it and moved on to his next project, um, uh, Atlantic Records CEO Ahmed Erdogan came in and said, I think you need to go back in and redo some of the album. No problem, boys. You're out on the road and we back and having fun. You know, Rick, write a few more songs, and uh, we'll go back in in three or four or five months and, and record, you know, and record a few new songs and kind of just beef things up. So the right. actual, uh, you know, uh, Amit allowed us to then go redo the record. And when Tom was... You know, Tom was busy doing other artists at that time, and, and we decided to stay at Criteria Studios and went with Ron and Howard Albert, who had done uh, 
oh, anybody from Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Stephen Stills to Dave Mason Records and stuff. And uh, they came in and we beefed it up and we did, you know, doubled or tripled acoustic guitars to make it fatter and more vocals and added drums to Sweet and Sour on my song, which had been kind of a real Crosby, Stills, and Nash kind of lighter song with no drums. And so we kind of right. just added to it and put it out, and sure enough, strange way, out of the box, went into the top ten and stayed there most all summer. That's my favorite song. In 1978. Song. That's my favorite song, Strange Way. I love that song. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and David, you know, David's flute solo on the end of that, when we turn into the, into the kind of a Latin feel, mm -hmm. you know, and have him take it off, I mean, that is the high point of every gig we ever play. Yes, really. you play in Mexico or Firefall yep. singing You're the Woman or whatever. There's a lot of high points, and we get a lot of standing ovations and stuff. But David's flute solo in Strange Way is always, night after mm -hmm. night after night live, the high point of our, of our show. And it's just great because David killed it, and the song was a huge hit. And, uh, you know, it just takes people back to where they were in 1978. And then Joe Lala comes in. Um, I, I saw a gig he guys did in, in, in a college in Florida or something, but he kind of stretches it out with his congos, you, you know, at yeah. the end, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, what, what, you know, and when, and, and when we don't have uh, anybody playing congos or percussion on stage, you know, some of the grooves aren't exactly the same, but having Lala right. play with us whenever that was, Mm -hmm. You know, is just the best, was the best, and we miss Joe, and, uh, you know, he's playing in that great band in heaven with all those yes, people. Yes, he is. Yeah. Now, was Fleetwood Mac, um, and Mick Fleetwood, was he actually really thinking about managing the band, or? Did he did. They did. He did. They did for a while. Really? And <laughs> it was interesting because even though Amit. Erdogan had said, why don't you guys go redo the album? Mm -hmm. um, there was a release date, and it was going to be released in a couple of weeks. And Mick Fleetwood, we were on the road with them during uh, not only the White Album quite a bit, but also during Rumors. And, and you know, going, going to the management question that you asked about, you know, that was one of the problems that Firefall had all along, and it was totally on our shoulders. You know, we, uh, we picked the wrong manager. We couldn't keep a good manager. We, you know, we had about a different manager every year for about three or four years in our heyday and yeah. consequently suffered because of that. And yeah. uh, at the time when we were about to get a new manager, when our, first, uh, when our third album was coming out, uh, Kiss's manager, Bill Coyne, was interested in us. And Earl mm. Hartley, who did Loggins and Messina, was interested. And we met with them and Mick, Fleet, Mick Fleetwood from Limited Management. And, uh, you know, and Mick came in and said, this album isn't good enough. You guys really need to beef it up some. And we said to him, well, the album that we finished was done and accepted, and we have a release date. And he said, it's never too late. And, uh, and when we went with him, he flew to New York City and met with all the bigwigs of Atlantic, and they didn't have a, any clue what it was. They're going, Mick Fleetwood, he was, the, he was like the biggest guy in the music industry that year. You know, yeah. well, I wonder what he would want to talk to us about. And he, he <laughs> came up and he said, stop the presses. And, you know, and that pretty much assured us that we could redo the album, and I'm glad we did, because the album that we made wasn't as good as the one that we remade. So, you know, right. one of those deals happened. Well, Elon hit platinum status. You know, I mean, you guys could have been just as big as Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, I thought. I mean, you guys were headed that way, you know. And then uh, after Undertow, I think things kind of fell apart a little bit, right, in the band? Yeah. And, you know, truthfully, we had a couple of guys with substance abuse problems or right. alcohol problems. Um, we had, um, we basically 
put the band together back in 1975 mm -hmm. because everybody fit a niche that we needed. You know, a great drummer, a great songwriter, a great guitar player, or this and everything. As in terms of compatible personalities and being really good friends, we were. But boy, as the years went by, some of the psychological or personal issues between band, band members, like happens with a lot of bands, sure. started to materialize. And when, you know, when you're out on the road, like, you know, uh, four out of five months a year, you know, twice, you know, with a, maybe a three-week break sometime, the pressure and, the, and the, the whole thing about that, and we were having financial problems with our managers, one of which sued us for way too much money that we had to deal really? with. And there were just so many things that were going on that by huh. the time that Mark Andes left the band, um, I think it was right after Undertow, and then Michael left, and then it was Rick and Larry and David and I, and then Larry left, and then it was just Ricky and David and I, and it, you know, it started, the band started falling apart, and um, internally, it wasn't anybody's problem except our own, and um, you know, and we kind of lost a little bit of the magic in the studio, and we're kind of, I guess, trying to grow out of that, you know, oh, pigeonhole that you are the woman being such a huge hit was, you know, like like I said, our record label won a 10 You Are the Woman record. And, uh, you know, we wanted to do a lot of other stuff, too. So we had an amazing run for about four or five years. Right. And, you know, and that's what that four or five year run that Fireball had kept us in business, business for 25 years after that. Yeah, that's right. Well, you brought the, you brought the band back with a lot of different uh, lineups. And uh, I tell you, you guys, you guys did a very good job in 93 with an album called The Great... Uh, no, you did, you, you did the song The Great Flood, which was really cool. And oh, you mean uh, When the River When the Rises? River Rises? Yeah, When yeah. the River Rises. Yeah. You know, I was kind of a late bloomer as a songwriter. Uh huh. And uh, because, I, you know, I had joined into a band that had two guys that had songs coming out of every pocket, you know, and I was a good guitar player, the lead guitar player and stuff. When I started really developing into a songwriter, um, a lot of my songs that I would write wouldn't be the boy meets girl or boy loses girl right. kind of song. You right. know, I started, you know, being a socially conscious guy and not happy with what some of what was going on with society. I started writing tunes that kind of came from down deep and, you know, uh, and when the River Riser was, we had done a tour of the flooded Midwest in St. Louis and Des Moines and a couple of other places where we'd go into town and we would have either canceled our show or had, a, had to put it two miles back from the river because the river had overflowed its banks and had, you know, inundated Alton, Illinois, for instance. And I'll tell you, what was interesting was I had toyed with the idea of a song named When the, when the River Rises a mm. couple of years earlier and had it on one of my work cassette tapes. And I woke up one the night after I got back from that tour and I sat up in the dark in bed and went, Went the River Rises. That what a great title and I went and I had just <laughs> experienced, you know, people losing everything and being flooded and you know, and yep. having you know, all this stuff and I went back through my tapes and actually found the sixty seconds of me kinda of coming up with the idea and once I found that, I went, Wow, this is great and I wrote a song in about a you know, fifteen, twenty minutes from that and uh felt like man, we need to get this out here and see if I can make a little money to help flood mm -hmm. relief. Firefall mm -hmm. recorded it like two days after I wrote the song, and about five days after it was finished, yep. I took it back to St. Louis and played it on the radio for the first time, like five days after it was written. And what was interesting about the song to me was it's a real positive message song about you know, being strong and and gaining 
you know, gaining strength in adversity and dealing with bad stuff that's going on in your life. And, you know, and a lot of the tunes that I had written, including my suicide prevention song and, mm-hmm. and some other ones in that kind of vein, were really positive message songs, which, when you think about it, suicide is one of the hardest you know, subjects to try to write anything positive about. You know, but, uh, you know, so I was developing into a writer that kind of stretched out and did some other things. And for a, a few years, when the River Nurses made a little publishing money, money and I donated it to uh, sources in St. Louis or, or Des Moines or whatever, and we played a few benefits back there, and it was just a cool deal. And um, interesting how music and songs can somehow help, help people. Uh, oh, it's helped me my whole life. If I didn't have music, I don't know where I'd be right now. And you know, it, no kidding. Most people, most people timeline their lives of what was playing on the radio at that time. You know, it's exactly. And, and you know yeah. what the truth is? It's like I've been asked a bunch of times. Oh man, doesn't it get old when you go do these meet and greet crap your show and you know have to shake everybody's hand and hear their story? And I went, absolutely not. Right. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, you'll meet a couple that'll tell you, oh, we got married to Just Remember I Love You and have been in love since, or you don't know how much that song meant to me, or, you know, my favorite song of Firefall is Boom, and the reason why, and you really hear people's stories, and they open up to you about how emotionally that either helped them through a hard time or helped determine what the good times were, a song of ours, and I mean, what an honor. I mean, it's like to hear that your music that that I didn't even write, but I played on and that Firefall made, you know, really helped people make it through some hard times or whatever, and it, it's, a, it's a blessing, and it never gets old. I, I still get emotional with Strange Way, to be honest with you. You know, oh, really? every time I hear that song. I, I don't know what it is about that song, but it does something to me. <laughs> Right. I, believe me, I have you a couple know? songs that, when they play, does that to me, too. But, uh, what a great song. And again, the synergy of the band, when you put those six people together in the studio, actually right. seven with Joe Lala, um, mm-hmm. you know, what we did a lot of the time was really magical. Yeah. And of course, not every song that we recorded or every solo I played or every lyric written, you know, on a Firefall song was, was great or you know, otherworldly, but boy, those those times that were, that really just hit people, it's like, I'm um, just real fortunate to be in the position I'm in. So. Yeah. I, I got to talk about this album, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and what I understand, uh, Redstone Records didn't have the distribution clout to get the CD into all <laughs> stores, and that was Messenger. Uh, 1994. The fans loved it, and I love that album. And it, and it's exactly what you were talking about with the songwriting. Uh, you know, very very meaningful lyrics. Uh, innocent victim. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, you know. Right. Tell it. You know. Uh, no means no. Well, tell you're you're one of the few guys that 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 heard or liked that album. And oh, yeah, I thought it was a great album. Dealing with a small label. You know, it had its uh-huh. albums back, and that was back, of course, when albums sold and you know, and publishers made money and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The music business is so weird today, where a songwriter has written a a hit song who's gotten <clears throat> millions and millions of airplays and everything is still making no money. It's like, gosh, how mm-hmm. does that work? But back then, yeah, you needed a label to kind of push things, and they kind of didn't have the clout and didn't know what we were right. doing I mean, what they were doing and you know it's part of what you know reality and stuff but thank you for saying about those songs um, and you know you're you're not alone is actually the song it's basically talking about a person telling someone who's in you know crisis I'm right. here with you I've been there before you know come come talk with me and you know I'll help you through bad times I basically stole my own lyrical idea when it when I was asked to write the suicide prevention song, Call On Me, um, which ended up becoming 
for about three or four or five years, kind of the song that was played whenever any of the suicidology people in Washington D.C. or mm-hmm. you know would be would be played and stuff. And I, I kind of plagiarized my own "You're Not Alone" to become <laughs> "Call on Me," and the song "Call on Me," which is on my Blight Side solo record, um, basically is about the guy on the hotline phone talking to yep. a kid in crisis and saying, come on back, or, you know, get, come back from the edge, you know, you're important, people care about you, you know, and just talking someone down from that crisis point. And, uh, you know, we've all been there at different times, you know, in terms of needing some, some advice or friendship or just some, you know, a hug or something. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of my songs come out and end up being about that kind of stuff. I, I, I had uh, Corey Glover, the uh, lead singer, frontman for Living Color, on the uh, oh, wow. show recently, and he did a song about uh, suicide. That he was in a very dark place at one time, and he wrote a song about it. And I, I brought it up. I, I know it was a touch, touchy subject for him, but you know, God bless you for even putting that to music. You know, I lost my best friend to suicide. Uh, we've lost a lot of rockers to suicide, which is very sad. You know, I, I, yeah. I interviewed Keith, Keith Emerson, a uh, really nice guy. Um, the, the last tour for Ronnie Montrose, I was there for with him and his wife. Uh, again, wow. Larry Hoppin, Larry Hoppin from New Orleans. Oh my God! You yeah, know, it's, it's, it's and it you goes know, on the, and, on. The and all the military guys, is, and, and 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 not just musicians, of course, but yeah, um, so many musicians that basically drink themselves to death or, you know, do something that isn't like killing yourself as in what a traditional suicide would be. There's a lot of rockers and creative people who basically just, you know, can't handle it and drink themselves to death. And it's so sad. And when I was a spokesperson doing a lot of stuff with the cause, suicide prevention, um, you know, it was, you know, I'd go down to these conventions play my song, Meet People, like a third of the people that were there in attendance in these nationwide conferences, a third of them would be the professionals of the suicide prevention industry out of Washington or New York. A third of the people would be the hotline phone people who talked to kids in crisis on the line, which was amazing talking to them. And the other third was parents from young people who had, who had uh, taken their own life, and I've met a few few families where there were two kids in the family that committed suicide, and it was just heart-wrenching and so sad, and and a lot of times, I'm, I'm no expert on it or anything, but a lot of times, it's just those people in crisis crying out for attention, or crying yeah. out for somebody to pay attention to them you know, and hear their story or hear their pain. And that's that's why it was so fulfilling to me to have my song Call On Me play even a really small role about starting up the first ever nationally coordinated 800 suicide hotline. So that the one of the things that I thought was really great about it was that, so if there was a young person in Texas who called the National 800 Suicide Hotline, he wasn't routed to somebody in Boston who kind of talked a different language than he did. You know, he got to the... He was immediately connected to the nearest location in Texas, and, you know, and, uh, you know, and and that made a big difference to a lot of kids. And, uh, you know, and uh, so it was was a, a fantastic partnership for me and um you know and i still do some stuff with them and you know my heart goes out to anybody that has those emotional problems that feels like they're all alone and that's where music comes in because sometimes music's all a person has that's right that's right i agree with that you know you know you know what's sad too is uh a lot of people miss the signs of people that are really having trouble and having issues and like you said, there's nobody for them to talk to, and if only somebody would sit down and, and listen, that might you know help a great deal. But right. you know sometimes it doesn't help, and you know they end up. Sometimes it doesn't anyway. help, but 
yeah. in a lot of the cases where there was nobody to sit and listen or be empathetic or to say, hey, I'm here for you. Let me know if I can do anything for you. You know, suicide is such a a terrible thing. And, I mean, obviously it's horrendous and terrible for the person who went through it. But on a person who actually commits suicide and goes through with their threats, what a terrible thing for the in- the entire family, exactly. all of their friends. There, yeah. you know, it's like it, it. You know, it's a national tragedy, and particularly, you know, nowadays with, you know, uh, servicemen, American GIs that come back and have PS, you know, uh, post traumatic stress syndrome, and and um, you know, and just feel uh, totally alone and can't cope with things. You know, so I'm I'm a you know I, I'm I want to help those kind of people and you know in any way that I can which you know if music helps great because you know <laughs> because you know not being trained and not being out there I, you can do what you can do so I'm proud of call on me and some of the work I've done but it was just a uh, you know a little trickle of what needed to be done same thing with the money that we raised I did mm-hmm. I did three different um, suicide prevention benefits the first one was with Michael McDonald, and amazingly, Steve Winwood was there at the Bluebird in Nashville and oh, came wow. up and, and, and you know, and Michael, we did, um, uh, we did uh, Can't Find My Way by, Back Home by Blind Faith. You know, oh, I'm wow. going, oh my awesome. God, I'm on stage with Steve Winwood, you know, <laughs> and, he's, and he kind of waves and he's going to get down off the stage and Michael grabs his arm and saying, oh no, you don't, we have to do Give Me Some Lovin'. You know, and so here I am on stage with Steve Winwood singing Give Me Some Lovin' and cool singing on a mic backgrounds with Michael McDonald, another one of the greatest singers ever. And David Pack from Ambrosia was on stage. It was like, wow, yeah. I can die and go to heaven now. <laughs> to, play, to play Give Me Some Lovin' with Stevie Winwood? Woo. That, that is so cool. That's awesome. No kidding. But the, the story about you... Um, with Eric Clapton in the studio was was so cool. I mean, like you said, it's a good thing he didn't know he was in the studio, right? <laughs> yeah, and you know, I sometimes tell that story before we play Mexico on stage, and you know, it was it was so interesting because that's when I was playing my my own Les Paul and a Fender Super, and I could sustain on any note, on any fret, on just about any you know anything I wanted to do, and it was like great and criteria, you know, we were down the hall from the Bee Gees, and Stephen right. Stewart was in another studio, and here was this unknown band, Firefall, recording a record, and people were in and out of the control room, and Jim Mason, the producer, asked me if I was ready and warmed up. I said, yeah, let's go, and we played it, and uh, and it ended up being a one-take solo, and he said, come on in, that was great, and when I went in, there was Eric Clapton sitting there having watched me play, and I just crumbled. I was like, oh, uh, I turned into Jackie Gleason, you know. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to. That's so cool. And he stood, he stood up and shook my hand and said, keen playing, man, and left. Yeah. The only time I've ever met Eric Clapton, but like yeah. so many tens of thousands of lead guitar players from my genre and my, my age group, I mean, Eric Clapton was it. Yeah. I, I got to hang out a little bit with uh, Alvin Lee backstage, and uh, cool. also John Mayall, and uh, it was Mayall's birthday, his 80th birthday here in Sarasota, in the Sarasota wow. area, when I covered the show, and uh, I knew the promoter, and the promoter, I says, uh, well, I want to get John's set list for my review, and he grabs me, and he throws me in the dressing room, John's dressing room, <laughs> and shuts the door behind me, you know, and I'm there with John... Uh, may all just you know sitting there talking and hanging out and <laughs> it was it was so cool you know it's like you know music aficionados would only understand what it is to be in a room with john may all you know it, right. a lot of people today probably wouldn't you know but you know the, the, the godfather you know of, of uh, yeah blues. exactly and it kind of goes you back know? to that thing where a lot of american you know musician lover you know kids didn't discover the blues, you know, which was our homegrown, you know, yep. 
form of music that America had, you know, all by itself. We didn't discover it until people like Clapton and and uh, John Mayall and you know uh, the original Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green yep. came to Peter America Green. and was playing the blues. And went, wow! Yeah, that's, that's very, <laughs> you know, very I have true. To say, I have to say that in your in your long introduction of me, when you mentioned the night in uh, Houston, Texas, when I was amazed to be there in not only on stage but later at, at Neil and Linda's hotel yeah. room, and we went to Neil's suite <laughs> and got to hang out pretty much until dawn with uh, and Emmy Lou and Linda Ronstadt had just met that night, and back in the hotel room, Graham would grab a guitar and he must have played like. 50 country songs that I'd never heard of before, you know, yeah. country songs by the Lubin Brothers, and I'd never heard of them before either at that time, not being a country guy, and to watch and listen to Emmy Lou and Linda sit real close together and put their voices together for the first time in harmony was just one of the absolute highlights of my life and career. Wow. It, it, Unbelievable. You, got, you, you played with a legend, Graham Parsons. Uh, what, what I understand was that you kind of turned things around a little bit. They, they weren't having a, a successful tour or something, and, and then you came in, <laughs> and, and things changed after you came in, right? It got better. <laughs> uh, well, okay, yeah, you know, I'll go with that. <laughs> really what happened was, so, now, you you probably know that it was Rick Roberts and Chris Hillman when they were in the Flying Breeder Brothers who discovered Emmy Lou Harris playing in a little club outside of Washington D.C. Right. I, I didn't and, I didn't know they and, discovered her. No. So it was Rick Roberts and their roadie right. that went to this place, saw Emmy Lou Harris. Rick calls Rick calls Chris back at the hotel. Chris, come down here. You got to hear this gal. Mm-hmm. And Chris was going, man, I'm already in the bed. No, I just get down here. So Chris comes down from the hotel and goes and hears Emmy Lou Harris and within about a half hour he called Graham on the phone and said, I think we found the girl you're looking for, the female singer. And mm-hmm. sure enough. So anyway, when they were putting their band together and the G P album was just being released on Warner Brothers and they were going to go out on tour and do that, um, their first choice was you know, James Burton, who Elvis was still playing and wouldn't let James go do a tour with somebody else. But mm-hmm. James Burton was out of the question. And their second their second uh, pick was Clarence White, who was still playing with Roger McGuinn and the Birds. Right. And, you know, so they're going, we don't want a guitar player. And Emmy said, I know a guy in Washington, D.C. So they flew him out sight unseen for the last few days of rehearsal in L.A., and they got on their bus, and it just so happened that their first gig in on this month-and-a-half-long tour was in Boulder, Colorado, where I live. Hmm. And they get out to the gig, and the guy that that Emmy Lou knew, who was going to play lead guitar, was so nervous, and he was more of an acoustic guitar player and not so much a, an electric player, and he was not a drinker, and he was so nervous that he got pretty drunk that night, first night, just to try to get right. through the first gig. And the word came out, you know, we got to find a guitar player because we, we don't want to cancel the tour. We need a guitar player. And the, um, and the manager of that club calls me and says, get your ass down here, you might have a gig. And I said, with who and what? What is what? And he said, Grant Parsons. <laughs> And the following was I went to Ron and said, you know, I'm from, from the Birds and the Flying Breeder Brothers. And I went, oh, okay. So I went down there and saw that first gig, and the guy did suck, and the band was not rehearsed and wasn't that great. Right. And they, the manager introduced me to Phil Kaufman and Eddie Tinker, the manager, and, and to Graham, and they said, well, why don't you come and play with us tomorrow night? Just sit in with us, and we'll see what happens. Now, I was not a country guy at all. I didn't hmm. know any country music, and you know, so I really wasn't the best guy that they could have gotten. But I was a really good lead guitar player, and I was a rock player. And the story was that when I sat in with them up at the Pioneer Inn in Nederland, Colorado, right. they said, well, we need... 
a good country picker, we need a good rhythm guitar player, and we need a good rock lead player. And, Jock, you're two out of three of those. <laughs> because I wasn't a country picker. They could tell I was not a country guy. You know, and the guy that I was about to replace, they said, um, two out of three is better than zero out of three. You're hired. And oh, I had to, that? I, after that, that gig, I drove back to Boulder, packed a suitcase, got my guitars and my amp, and got on the bus the next morning to drive to Texas to play our first gig. So it was, for me, the perfect, being at the best place at the best time, right. even though I wasn't a really good country player. And here I was, uh, Neil Flans, the steel player, on the bus down. He was dropping the needle on a, on a record and helping me try to learn James Burton's you know, country licks. Which yeah. was ridiculously hard to do, but you know, and, uh, so, you know, I was not the best guy to to be in the Fallen Angels with Graham, but yeah, we rocked and we were pretty solid and we found our legs with me, the new yep. guitar player, and uh, you know, and went out on the road for about a month and a half and played a bunch of cities and, mm-hmm. and that's where I met Rick Roberts in at uh, at Max's Kansas City in New York City, and yep. he said. You live in Boulder? I live in Boulder. Hey, we should get together sometime. It's amazing. It's a, yeah. It's a great great story. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Blindside. That's your most recent album, right? Uh, my only album. I'm not a solo guy. I'm a, a band <laughs> guy. I'm a, like a lead I, guitar player who functions best when there's, you know, three or four or five other personalities and players around me. But back well, in I love the I love that, the album. Everybody needs to go well, out and get you. Blindside by Jock Bartley. Um, my favorite song on there is "You Need Love," that's because you know you rock out on that one. That, that that's an awesome tune. You, yeah. you know, all the tracks are Thank great. You. you you got some slide there on uh, "I Used to Say," which is a, another great song. Right. And well, thank uh, you. And that's and, another uh, album that I tried to kind yep. of promote and do myself. Yeah. <laughs> which, yeah. I got. Tough. I sent a lot of, um, lot of copies of that to to Europe, and and certain songs off of the Blindside record got a lot of airplay over in Europe, you know. And you know, it was like, wow, I didn't play in you know, four sessions in France and all this kind of stuff. But it never turned into sales and, and yeah. whatever. And then you know, a few months later, it was just over, you know. So trying to break commercially. You know, music is so, right. so, so difficult. Oh, today it's ridiculous. You, you can't know? do it. I mean, it's impossible yeah. today. Yeah, it is, yeah. I mean, you know, look at uh, mainstream radio. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I, I was a top 40 guy back in late, the late 70s. So I played top 40 music. So I, I, I've seen all the changes. And, you know, there was still hope back then, even though disco was coming in, and then you had new wave and all that. But it was it was still a nice eclectic mix. I was still playing Zeppelin, you know, and stuff like that on the uh-huh. radio, you know, and Firefall, of course. But I I did like the back album. The, I really back. liked it. Yeah. Oh, it, well, uh, well, thank you very much. And you know what? I've I've thought that you know there were there were a couple tunes on that that I should somehow re-release or I think so. You know, yeah. Or or do something you know with and I just kind of have never gotten around to it, but that you know, kind of brings me brings me into uh, the subject of at long last Firefall as you know is in the studio working on new music. I I, I heard something from Mark. <laughs> yes, I'll bet you did. I did. I and I also heard something about Nature's Way. You have, and I guess the cat's out of the bag. Our new manager and us have been figuring out, well, when are we going to, A, when are we going to be able to release the song and actually put it out there for people, you know, to hear and to buy and the consumption of all of that, which we're shooting for either July 1st or July 15th. Awesome. But also, when when do you let the cat out of the bag that uh, Nature's Way is happening with certain guest stars? And... Uh, so Mark already answered that, and it's great. Yes, he did. <laughs> don't get mad at so Mark. You know what? I don't want to be in the middle of that. <laughs> for, for, for anybody who, who didn't hear the Mark Andes interview, um, so <laughs> one, of, one of 
Spirit's most amazing songs back in 68, 69, when they were happening in Spirit, by the way, for people who don't know about that kind of progressive underground rock band who made a lot of waves out of California back then, you know, they, they went on the road with Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, the big brother in the yeah. Holy Company, and 10 years after, and, you know, all these great, amazing things. They played at the Atlanta Pop Festival. They, they were huge stars. I loved Spirit. And yep. one of Randy California's best songs was Nature's Way, which right. is so ecologically pertinent right now still. Um, so we started, after Mark rejoined the band about four years ago, he kind of thought that it would be a good idea to include some of our family tree and our genealogy from our past, not only including yep. spirit, but with the birds and and Parsons and different things from Firefall's uh, genealogy mm -hmm. tree. And sure. I said, let's do Nature's Way. And he said, great. And Mark, of course, has never been a real lead singer, you know, a lead singer of a band that he's been in. And he's got a really good voice. And, um, you know, and we said, well, why don't you sing Nature's Way? And so for about the mm -hmm. last two years, um, we've been adding it to our set, and it just goes over amazingly. And so I asked Mark a few months ago, well, I think we should record the song. I mean, it would be great. Um, you know, who knows? It probably won't ever get on the radio with radio being what it is today. But, um, you know, we deserve it. Mark, you deserve it. You know, Randy California deserves it. Let's do it. Right. And he said, okay. Right. And what was interesting was when Firefall did the Colorado Music Hall of Fame induction show, and Irving Azoff of the Eagles had allowed Timothy B. Schmidt to come and play with Poco for one night, which was up in the air for a month or two. They didn't know if Timmy was going to be able to or not. Um, so backstage and in the dressing rooms, Poco's dressing room was right across the hall from Firefall's, Mark and Timothy B. Schmidt had met a few times, but never really got to be friends or hung out. And so that, after they had played and after we had played, <laughs> Mark and Timothy were hanging backstage, and it was so cool to hear Mr. Timothy B. Schmidt, an mm -hmm. eagle, one of the biggest bands in history, tell Mark Andes, when I was a teenager in... Um, Sacramento, whenever whenever Spirit would play in L.A. or San Diego or San Francisco, I'd take a five- or eight-hour road trip and come and hear you guys play, and you were my hero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Mark's kind of like blushing and going, well, well, thanks, didn't know what to say, but they really <laughs> hit it off, and it was really cool to see them together, and I took a couple of really good pictures of the two of them, which we then put on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, the, Tim, the Timothy B. Schmidt band, after Glenn Fry had died and Timothy was doing a band of his own for a little while, they played in Houston where Mark lived, and Mark got off a, a few gigs of Firefall and that day went and heard Timothy B. Schmidt, and Mark, out of the blue, said, Firefall's recording Nature's Way, would you please sing on it? And Timothy said, absolutely. And so suddenly it was like, Oh boy, <laughs> when can we when can we get it to him? And so uh, we're about to mix and master the song next week. It's awesome. all finished, and uh, not only is Timothy B. Schmidt from the Eagles on Nature's Way singing the second verse and harmonizing with Mark, which is great, but also uh, John McBee from the Doobie Brothers played yep. uh, played uh, mandolin and some pedal steel on it. So we have a couple of guest stars, and we'll be putting. Firefall's version of the Randy California song, Nature's Way, we'll be putting that out in July sometime, and we're very excited about it. That, that's awesome. Jo John is such a great musician, too, with the Doobie Brothers. I, I met him once here in Orlando, and he, he's such a good guy. That, that's going to be a good great, guy, great musician. Oh, yeah. That's going to be a great, great song when you guys put that out. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the, the whole album, of course. Right. Well, you know, albums take so long, particularly when the five guys in the band live in different states. <laughs> so we meet yeah. up in Florida when we're, we've got a gig. Hey, 
but um, we're finishing up three or four other new Firefall songs, and we have one other surprise in our pocket that I can't tell you about. But I think what we're going to do is really try to finish five or six songs and mm-hmm. put out an EP or half an album or whatever, because yeah. if we would wait for, for 12 or 10 songs to get finished, you know, it wouldn't be till next year or whatever, and we want to definitely right. get Nature's Way out there as soon as possible. So we're in the middle of uh, putting out some new product, and we're excited <clears throat> to uh, get it out there and let, let our fans hear. Good. I, I asked Mark, I said, you know, I, I had Rick Roberts on the show. You know, I know he had the accident, and he went through hell with all that, but he sounded pretty good, you know, on the interview and everything. You think there's any chance he'll ever come back and do some few songs with you guys or something? What may happen is um, Rick has a big catalog of unrecorded songs, right? and we've asked him to send us whatever he thought the, quote, new Firefall could, you know, might do. So we're looking at a few of the Rick Roberts songs, to oh, uh, to possibly include on this next album because Rick's one of the greatest songwriters around and uh, and also wrote all of our hits and you know when you think about all those songs of from Firefall Records of the seventies Strange Way and Just Remember I Love You and So mm-hmm. Long and Living Ain't Living and all these great songs so that's how we may plug Rick in he is still battling trying to get his voice back. Right. And, you know, and God bless him, you know, he's not doing the, you know, he's written a couple of books, so he so he does these things where he'll yep. go to a club and take a guitar and sing a few songs and tell stories about his past or, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. And it's, it's really cool. But in terms of being up to the level of professional singer that I know he would want to be at again, yeah. he's not quite there yet. Right, right. God love him, and, and, and yeah. fire, there wouldn't be a firefall without Rick Roberts. I'd say yeah, that any good, time anybody asks. Real good guy. We talked about his book. Uh, I, I had a, kind of a same discussion with Lou Graham from Foreigner. You know, it took him a long time to get back, but he's finally, you know, singing again after uh, his issue. Yeah, he he was really sick for a while. Uh, he almost died. Yeah, he almost died. Yeah, I mean, they took a, a brain tumor out. They got him. It was the size of a tennis ball or a golf ball or something. I don't even know, but you know he's yeah. lucky to still be with us. And I, I tell you what, Luke Graham, back in the early days of Ford, Ford or you know, the, you know, seventy eight, seventy nine, eighty, there wasn't a better rock singer in the world than him. That's right. You're he absolutely was fantastic. right. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, another guy that had issues. He's a friend of mine too. Is Jesse Colin Young. Uh, oh, he had really? Lyme disease, Lyme disease for a long time, and he thought he was going nuts because they couldn't figure out what it was. And now he's back yeah, on the road. But, my sister, yeah. my older sister had that, and yep. for the first ten years they couldn't figure out what it was. And then they finally said, oh, "It's got to be Lyme disease. You must have been yep. bitten by a tick." I had no idea that Jeffy Colin Young had, had gone through that. <clears throat> Well, you know, all, all my interviews on the radio, I've done a million interviews, but just the radio interviews are all on YouTube. If you punch in my name, you'll see them. And if you, you want to learn anything about Lyme disease, I got, I got my interview with Jesse on there. If you know anybody that needs any help or anything, because he's got... Wow. Uh, he was cured, basically, <clears throat> but it took him a while. I have seen, uh, I have seen uh, some uh, advertising <clears throat> of him playing gigs again. Yep, nowadays, playing gigs again. Which is great. Yeah, you know, and, and and we all know whether you're around the music industry or in the, in, uh, in as a player or a band, we all have a lot of those people who didn't make it past their addictions or didn't make it past any of yeah. the stuff that they went through, and it's it's just really sad. And, and you know, and we're survivors, and yep, to have in back back to Firefall to. To have Mark and David and I up on stage there, you it's know, incredible. it's a very formidable thing. Yeah. And our new singer, Gary Jones, who's from Nashville, who's been a friend of mine, sounds a lot like Rick Roberts uh, from the records back in the huh. 70s. You know, and our drummer, Sandy Ficka, kicks it out. And, yep. you know, it's really, it's, it's really powerful. And when you play, you know, not only all of Rick's, great songs, but Larry's song, Cinderella, 
you know, when we play those live, you know, people are just like going, wow, and it's, it's great. And I know how fortunate and lucky I am to still be in this position, and I know back to, uh, you know, the 70s how lucky I was to be at the right mm-hmm. place at the right time once or twice in my career to be suddenly on the road with Graham and Amy Lou or meeting Rick Roberts and, hey, we got a record deal, yeah. you know. It was amazing. You know, I, and, I, I and that, a, uh, that has to make you humble. It has to I make did a, you humble because uh, you can't be on an ego trip about that because I know how many hundreds of thousands of great lead guitar mm-hmm. players there are out there who never got a break, you know? Yeah. Well, you're a great guitar player, man. Uh, well, thank you. You know, uh, Cinderella is like, what What an intro, you know? That's one of the great intros of all time is, is Cinderella. <laughs> I got. I got to mention one other thing on your la- on your album. I thought okay. Carlos Santana was on "Just Let Go" on that track. Oh my oh, god! Yeah, and that's, 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 that's my son that's... Jamie playing drums on that. Really? That's, that's my Santana. You, that's you my sound... Santana impression. You got to do some more Latin uh, music, man. <laughs> you, you, yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, just... yeah, you know, I um, well, you, my my main influences. Now, I was a, a, a jazz and classically trained guitar player by the world-famous right. guitar player Johnny Smith, uh, uh-huh. who ended up, you know, his claim to fame, even though he played with Doc Severinsen and, and Stan Getz and, and Bing Crosby and all these great people, you know, uh, his claim to fame is that he wrote Walk, Don't Run for the Ventures. Right. <laughs> uh, but um, I, was, I was a trained... Guy, but boy, when the Beatles first came out, you know, it was like, oh, I didn't want to learn jazz chords anymore. I wanted to be in a band <laughs> and play Beatles songs. And then when I heard Eric Clapton play the first time, that literally changed my life. You know, that when I bought Fresh Cream, and I'd never heard of that, but I liked the cover. I bought Fresh Cream and put the, the needle down, and, you know, his first solo, the, the heavens literally opened up and suddenly that was possible, and I went, I want to do that. But I I grew up on Clapton, George Harrison, and Carlos Santana, so mm-hmm. that's kind of a lot where my style and my tone and stuff came from. And it's interesting because you go, what, 15 years later than that, and a lot of young guitar players grew up on Eddie Van Halen, who's a great right. player, but right. suddenly there was a whole generation of guitar players who wanted to play <laughs> break that fast all the time and yeah. kind of lost all of its melodic quality. Exactly. And exactly. one of the things that I learned from Johnny Smith, yeah. and I don't think he ever really said this to me. I saw by example, sitting across from him between the ages of nine to about 13, was taste, being a tasteful player in music, isn't really what you play, it's what you don't play. Right. And that a lot of times the space and the holes you leave between musical passages speak louder than anything you could play. Mm-hmm. So I kind of grew up having this this tasteful, melodic way of answering back, you know, lyric and vocalist and trying to play musical passages and not just licks. That was instilled in me from the time when I was a little kid, so that by the time I was playing on Rick Roberts and Larry Burnett's song, that just kind of came out, and you know, and my melodic thing really fit with their melodic thing. I, I swear to God, I, I I thought I thought you had Carlos Santana as a guest artist. <laughs> it was well oh, when man. I wrote that thing, I kind of thought there was there was somebody who was saying, "Hey, man, I got some connections in Brazil. We should write a." Or we should put out a, a, a song that sounds like Carlos Santana. And it's like, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, that's I know you can. That's what it was about. <laughs> and the whole Brazil thing fell through. But, yeah, that's uh, me that me sounding like Carlos there. Wow. Who, who played congos on that? You had a good congo player on there, too. Uh, I don't even remember. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, uh, probably a local Colorado guy. Really, he was good. it might have been it might have been Christian Teal, who's the drummer yeah. on the E E Town band out of Boulder. Every year, every every week, they have 
different artists from James Taylor and Amy Lou Harris to up and coming people that do that yeah. radio show on NPR. So it might have been Christian who played congas on it. I don't know. I can't remember. Oh, that was a great tune, man. I, I want to I want to hear more of that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, you know, I I I I have thought because of that song, man, I could get together with, you know, a Latin writer or two and just nail sure. some, a couple of tunes with me playing Santana in the background and hey, let's yep. go. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to see you collaborate more, you know, with with some some really uh great legendary artists. That'd be awesome. Cuz, you yeah, know, Yeah, man. I, I think you'd be perfect. That's for what that. music's all about: sharing, not only yeah. sharing in the writing and the creating yep. and the recording, but you know, after you know, uh, for Firefall to be in a position now to play on the road with Ohio Speedwagon or America or right. Orleans or Atlanta Rhythm Section or Christopher Cross, like we do quite a bit, is just such a gift and so you know, it's so amazing to be on the bill with a bunch of those guys who had a lot of hits back in the 70s, too. So yeah. I know how fortunate I am. You know, we almost had a super group in the making here. Uh, Jeff O'Kelly, who I've covered shows with, uh, he, he also takes pictures, he's a photographer or whatever. I know he was... Oh, yeah, in, put, Jeff's great, and he, he works with yeah. Firefall and David Muse a lot. And And you guys were putting together the Boulder County Conspiracy, which had... You, Bobby right. Caldwell, who I've had on the show, which Bobby's awesome, Joe Lala, yeah. David Muse, and uh, Rick Roberts. And, it, but, and, but it and, just and never... at times there was also Paul Cotton from Poco and one or two other people. Wow. Yeah, what, a know, what a lineup. What a lineup. Yeah, and it never quite got off the ground, and we played like two gigs and kind of right. fell through. I have, I have a, a, a surprising little tidbit for you. I have a okay. new musical project on the side going with two of the guys from the Subdudes, John Maggie really? and Steve Amade. And uh. the bass player that we've been having play with this is Kenny Passarelli, who was in Barnstorm and helped write Rocky Mountain Way. So I just, I just had Kenny project. on the show. We don't have a band <laughs> name yet, but we're writing a lot really? of funky, funky songs, kind of a la Levon Hill and the band back in the day. And John huh. Magny's just the funkiest guy I know, and so we got a new project going out, and I'll let you know the name of it when we pick when we finally pick one. I just had Kenny and Joe Vitale on the show. We did a tribute uh, a tribute show, and uh, gosh, I'm losing my mind now. The, 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 the guy who's replacing Zephyr, um, oh Tommy Bolin. Tommy Bolin, Tommy Bolin. I'm, I'm losing it. That's what happens when you get to a certain age. But we did a tribute show to Tommy Boland, and uh, yeah, Kenny. Kenny's a great guy, and and, and me and Joe uh, traded books because we're both authors, and uh, yeah, that's awesome. That'll be a great project. We, we, Kenny's an awesome. Yeah, player. the the songs are amazing, and and frankly, nothing like anything that's being put out now. Because it, I mean, when you you think about the sub dudes, you know, and and yep. Steve Amade, who everybody thought, you know, and he is a great drummer, but. In their heyday, pretty much he only played a tambourine and made it sound like a set of drums. Hmm. But it was it's so much fun, and I'll keep you posted on that. Um, oh yeah, we'll have yeah, you back on the uh, show. Yeah. Uh, I've heard I've heard tell that Joe Walsh is um, is reforming for a tour or two or gigs uh, is reforming Barnstorm mm -hmm. after they they were inducted into the Colorado Music Hall of Fame last yep. summer. And yeah. I was there and saw them play, and it was just fantastic. Yeah, you know. And Kenny's Kenny's one of the best bass players around, and Joe Vitale. Yep. I mean, his his resume, not only as a drummer but a flute player. You know, you know. He he and Mark Andes used to play in um, in Dan Fogelberg's band for about five yep. years. Yep, that's another shame. You know, Dan Fogelberg. I I loved him, man. He had such a cool voice, you know, such a great voice. Absolutely. Yeah, he, he loved. Yeah, way getting old soon. sucks, and yeah. you know, and and different ailments and stuff. I'm battling some uh, arthritis, which is a challenge a little bit. But yeah. I know that so many other people have much more, you know, right. serious things going on. I just know how uh, fortunate I am to still be doing this and have people want to 
buy tickets to hear Firefall play because those songs are still meaningful for them. So yes, they are. I've always kept it since I've been band leader of Firefall for the last 35 years or whatever. You know, to me, Firefall is great because as band leader, I know that people are coming to are, are paying money and coming to see us to hear "You Are the Woman" or "Just Remember I Love You" or "Cinderella" sound like it's supposed to on the record. And right. by God, I want to keep those songs right. really sounding like they're supposed to. And, you know, a lot of bands, you know, and you can't blame them sometimes, but a lot of bands get so tired of playing their one big hit that they change it around and just to keep their own interest. And, you know, and they play the song and nobody can tell it's their favorite, their favorite <laughs> song until the chorus is. You know, what the heck? I so I yeah. keep a really tight rein on, you know, those three-minute songs or three-and-a-half-minute yeah. songs that people come to hear from Firefall, those have to sound like that. But at the same time, we have Strange Way and Mexico and Livin' Ain't Livin' to where David and I and Mark can stretch out and go places musically that maybe on a given night you've never been before. And, and you go and just jam and spontaneously play solos and take it wherever it's going to go. That is so cool to be able to still do. But you know... You're talking about stretching it out. You guys can get away with it because you got you've got that uh, that way about you where you can you know kind of get into that jam, and it sounds it sounds like the song no matter how how you how you present it. You know, it's kind of like Angry Eyes from Loggins and Messina. You know, that, right. that same kind of thing that you can just kind of stretch it out and it's still the song and it just gets better and better and better. Bands like right. Zeppelin cannot do it. I, I've seen Zeppelin several times, and when they stretch a song, it's terrible. You know, it's horrible, and then they, they, they don't know how to do it. And, and then you get Plant going ah ah for like five minutes, and it's like, what, what were we hearing? <laughs> what song were we hearing? <laughs> you know, right? But you guys, do and, you know, other other awesome. bands who who would like to be able to be a jam band too, or at least stretch out and and do yep. stuff. Their material might not. That true. And Firefall's true. a rare case where yep. you know you are the woman we could never stretch out. You know, just remember right, I love right. you. Nope, that's how it is supposed to be, and we're going to play it in three and a half minutes long. Period. You know, right. but Mexico or Strange Way, you know, David sometimes goes brand new places on that flute solo of his. Yep. And you know, and you know, it's really great because Firefall. You know, there'll be times when we'll get like. 10 or 12 standing ovations during a gig, and you're going, wow. That's, yeah. you know, they love us. Yeah. So you guys are masters of that. You guys are... Well, thank you. Cannot, you. you cannot screw up a song. <laughs> oh, believe me, you could. <laughs> and we could. <laughs> Jock, here, here's your last question, okay? This okay. is a, a question I ask everybody, and I get some very interesting answers from this. If you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, uh, to perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? Oh, my gosh. To, per to perform with or just to meet or in chat? No, no, no. You've got, you got, you got to play with them. Performing, collaborating with, um, playing guitar with. Well, and they, they can I mean, be passed away. So many you know? names, so many names come to to mind. But you know, I would love to be able to have have traded licks with my hero Eric Clapton. With Clapton, you know, and okay. the 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 guy that he's got playing the left-handed guitar guy, Doyle Bramlett or Doyle somebody, can't mm -hmm. think of his last name. I'm sorry, but he's got a great lead guitar player playing with him now from Austin, Texas. You know, okay. and I know Eric, you know, sits in with a lot of people. So I'd have to say maybe Eric Clapton, um, you know, and if it was anybody in history, you know, any one of the Beatles. Just let, let me at him. you know. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> the Beatles, you know, are still, you know, the best band ever. You know, when you think about the Beatles, and in one two-year period, they made Rubber Soul, Revolver, Yesterday and Today, and started... Sergeant Peppers, all in two yeah. years. Like, That's crazy. It's, it's amazing to think of yeah. how how great the songwriters were, and then talk about the chemistry in the studio with those four band guys 
and George Martin and Jeff Emmerich, the engineer, it's just like yep. unbelievable. So the Beatles are still the best ever and probably never to be challenged in my book. Yeah, they could have done anything without George Martin. And I and then also I guess um their engineers, was it Emmerich? Uh yep, Jeff their, Emmerich. Yeah. Yeah. But the, Well you I know give, it's I, interesting too because yeah. if you if you read Jeff Emmerich's book right. um they deliberately started trying at a certain point, not mm-hmm. not Rubber Soul, but in Revolver and then leading into Sgt. Pepper's, they started trying to paint pictures with the music. And mm-hmm. they put stuff up there that would be this visual, take people away kind of thing. Right, And right. me being a painter, too, it you know, like when you're in the studio and you're making a mix of the song and you're going to put... Mm-hmm the tambourine over here in this corner and you'll put the vocals over here and you'll put the guitar here and you it's like doing a painting kind of except it's all yeah. auditory and they were the masters of that you know mm-hmm. of making of taking you away in three and a half or four minutes physically putting you in a different place and then when the song ended you come back and go wow how yeah. great is that yeah, music, you know that's why is that's it, why man. album covers album covers were so important because that that kind of started it. You know, you first yeah. you look at the album cover and then you get into the music and it, it's already you got a mental picture of what the music might might sound like. You know, right? I, that's like the first album cover of Firefall where mm-hmm. I had the idea of something to do with either a comet or fire falling from the sky. Mm-hmm. You know, and. The art director of Atlantic Records said, "Hey, great idea, kid. Thanks. We'll take it from here." And and they had the the first album, Firefall cover with the comet reflecting in the lake. They did that photographically and then airbrushed, but perfect cover. It, it just looked like Colorado. And when you saw that and then listened to the songs, you're going, "Wow, it was great." So it's it, it's all a combination of me being an artist, a yep. musician, and all of that. It's kind of all. Oh, yeah. Tickling people's senses, you know. Yeah, a lot of musicians are artists. You know, they they do. Yes, paint, they are. You know, yeah. Did Did you meet uh, Ahmed from Atlantic? Oh Rock? yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Huh. Um, <laughs> only a few times, and I, I I do remember one time where uh, Ahmed and Rick Roberts and I drank just so much sake and just got shit faced. <laughs> Pardon me, I probably can't say that, but it's like yeah, sure, go know, ahead. He, We're okay. <laughs> But, you know, Ahmed was, you know, if you think about, you know, Ahmed and Aretha and Ray Ray Charles and he and Tom Dowd's history with Atlantic Records, yeah, it was such amazing. an honor to be on yeah. Atlantic Records when we got signed. And um, I was told, I'm not sure that this is still true, but when Firefall's first album came out, it went gold faster than any other album uh, mm-hmm. preceding it on Atlantic Records, which you're going, I read that. wow, there's Led that. Zeppelin, there's Aretha, there's you yeah. know, all these great acts, you know, and, and you know, we, it, w- it was really cool. Very, yeah. very cool, and, you know, I just, uh, it's it's great to still be doing it after all these years, and the Firefall songs that we play on stage still get people off, and uh, we love talking to them and, and seeing their smiling faces. Doc, I want to thank you, man, for for being on the show today, and of course, for my pleasure. Thank music. you for a great interview and really cool questions. For all the incredible music you've given us, uh, you're, you're on the road again. Coming up, you got some. Uh, are you guys thinking at all about going overseas? Uh, if we get hired, yeah. I mean, we've yeah. been to Europe four or five times, and Japan probably four or five times too. I haven't heard of anything upcoming, but with all right. the with all the groups that we play with, like Atlanta Rhythm Section or or, or Ambrosian or right. Orleans or a lot of those bands that had big hits in the 70s, too, you would think a package would work great in Europe. Definitely. Definitely. I hope we go. hope we yeah. go. That'll be awesome. Well, well, keep in touch, man. I want to know about the new album. And, uh, you know, we, Nature's Way, I definitely want to play that over the air. We'll send, we'll send you a copy as soon as it's done. I appreciate it, Jock. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate it. It's been a great interview, and we'll see all our fans out on the road. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much.
Thanks, man. For more information, more information about Jack Bartley and Firefall, visit www.firefallofficial.com or www.facebook.com backslash Firefall Official. Uh, purchase the most recent release by Firefall uh, Reunion Live, uh, February 26, 2009 at Amazon.com. Very special thanks to Trace Keane for uh, arranging this interview with Jock Bartley and, of course, the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of VBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of the Ray Shasho Show. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at the Ray Shasho Show at gmail.com. Don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, The True Story of a Neglectic American Family and Their Wacky Family Business. Or the second edition, Wacky Shenanigans on F Street, Proud to be Politically Incorrect in Washington, D.C. Available now at Amazon.com. I promise you'll live it. Have a great week. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ray Shasho Show. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com specializing in author and music artist publicity plans we shine when we make you shine join Ray Shasho every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific 6 p.m. Eastern on PBS Radio Station 1